Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Secure Talk. My name is Mark Schreiner, and I'll be your host for this episode of Secure Talk. Today, we're going to be talking with Jonathan Roizen, who is the co founder and CEO of Flow Security. Uh, Flow Security is a startup that is revolutionizing data security by providing the only platform that helps businesses secure their cloud data wherever it flows. We're going to be talking with Jonathan um, about Flow Security and what it does, but we're also going to be talking about data security posture management or DSPM and talk a lot about some of the differences between DSPM and CSPM, which is cloud security posture management. We might also get into the evolution of security tools over the next decade and maybe some other topics. But before we do that, let's say hi to Jonathan. Jonathan, how are you today? I'm very good. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great. Hey, you mentioned in the show that you're normally based in Israel, but you're down in Argentina right now. How are things in Argentina? Okay, actually, it's a, I think it's the perfect timing to be here in Argentina. I have a lot of family in Argentina, so we're actually here for a wedding. Uh, but I was extremely lucky to be here during the World Cup, where a few days right. before the the <laughs> final, um, and you know I'm I'm a bit of Argentinian myself, but what is happening here is complete madness. It's like a religion, and everyone is just happy in the street, uh, and I hope to be very happy after the final on Sunday as well. Well, I I wish you luck, and it's funny because um, my my neighbors here are Croatian. And they're normally a very quiet family. I never hear from them, but you know, I can always tell when it's World Cup time because for the last two Cup World Cups, the Croatian team has done amazing. And the, you, you will hear these just um, spontaneous eruptions of screaming and yelling and celebration. And uh, and 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 they did amazingly well, uh, considering they're a country of I think like three and a half million. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Argentina, it is a religion, so it's, it must be a really cool time to be there. Hey, um, before we, uh, before we get too far into the weeds, maybe can you tell, tell us a little bit about, you know, how did you come to co-found Flow Security? And, and maybe you can talk a little bit about your background and what led you into, um, to this position now. Sure. Um, so I've been doing cybersecurity the last, I would say, 15 or 16 years now. I started as an offensive cybersecurity practitioner, actually, uh, for several years. After that, I crossed the fence, you could say, um, and I led investigations of uh, like incident response after data breaches of Fortune 500 companies. Um, this is where I did, uh, you know, host-based forensics and log analysis and helped companies to get them out of the mud. Um, and this is also where I've seen how difficult uh, protecting data is in modern environments uh, because things have changed radically in the last few years, I guess. Um, you and your listeners are already aware of that, that now data is much, much more fragmented and also environments are keep changing all the time. Uh, and that, uh, that leads also to a lot of data breaches uh, in the last few months. Uh, and this only gets growing with time. And this is also where I've seen um, how difficult it is for us and for our customers when I led those investigations uh, to do it, uh, to have visibility, to reduce the risk, and to respond to uh, incidents. Um, and this is where I, I understood that it is time for the next generation uh, of data security platforms, uh, of automating many of the things that I've done uh, manually um, and many of the lack of visibility of our customers. Um, and this is how Flow started to solve exactly that. Great. Hey, I'm I'm kind of fascinated by this whole um, investigation side of things. Could you just tell me, like, I mean, what's the general process for conducting a um, post breach investigation? Sure. So we we gave all kind of we did all kind of services, not only post breach. Sometimes it was also risk assessment, manual risk assessment. Sometimes it was gaining visibility. But yes, most of the time it was post breach. Um, actually, it was fascinating and also a bit tiring, to be honest. <laughs> uh, we got, uh, I worked in, uh, it was a small startup, some services startup that grew very quickly. Um, and what, what happened usually is that we got a phone call, uh, usually from a company that is post breach. And you can imagine how is the atmosphere in that company at that time. 
Um, and sometimes they're like, help, of... help, quick, quick. <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah, it, it can start from, you know, an extortion mail um, requesting for money due to uh, data theft. It can be due to something that was published uh, in a newspaper. It can be anything, any kind of trigger that they understand that they had a major data breach. Um, and then we got a phone call. Sometimes in a matter of hours, we were on a plane with a team um, to help them to get them out of that uh, situation. And what we did was actually it, it, it can vary due to the uh, specific situation. And of course, I want to be able to give examples of specific companies because I am sure that all your listeners know our uh, um, our our customers. However, uh, I can say that big companies that you know we start to to understand first of all what has happened, collect a lot of information, logs, um, cloning hard drives, uh, understanding where, where it started from, find the, the you know the thread uh, to start the investigations, and usually in a matter of a few weeks we got the full story of what has happened, how the attackers uh, started uh, the whole problem, and and of course how it has to be solved. Um, so this is in a very in a nutshell. Excellent. And what specifically did you see from your previous experience that where the light bulb came on and said, hey, you know, um, w there's 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 an opportunity here for a startup that's going to I mean, I'm going to take this off of your brief uh, revolutionize data security uh, by providing the only platform that helps businesses secure their cloud data wherever it flows. Where, how did you see this? What was the light bulb moment? So before the revolution uh, comes the problem detection. And that is that what was pretty clear is that in the different verticals or the different scopes of a security team of a company, um, I mean, there is somewhat of control over what's happening uh, in the endpoints, right? And some controls over SaaS. And in the last few years, you mentioned in the introduction, a CSPM, Cloud Security Posture Management. Um, but when it gets to data, when you ask companies, I mean, what what they care the most? Uh, where do they store their customers' information, their, their personal uh, information like email addresses, social security numbers, or their credit card numbers, or health records? This uh, this is the core and the most I mean, the gold of companies. They don't even know where the the, the data might be in, and and again, the reason is that. The revolution started not from the security side, but actually from the engineering side or from the infrastructure, because things used to be somewhat simple, somewhat under control. There was a big database, big data lake, or a few of them. The question, where is my data, was pretty straightforward. However, today it's, of course, not the case. Data can be everywhere, uh, over thousands of different applications, databases, and even more than that, data does not have to be only in a company's environment because they're sharing data to external services like SaaS providers, just sending data to third parties. Every engineer can create a new database. Every small mistake of an engineer can cause data to be in the wrong place or non-protected or like with over permissiveness to the internet, etc. So it's just a matter of time until data breach happens. And this is exactly what I've seen um, while did investigating. You, did you walk yeah, sure. me through like a, a use case uh, or an example of of what you just described. Okay, hey, we've got this sensitive data, um, and it was shared with these various apps or, or tools or platforms, and we had you know this person spinning up an instance and putting a data out here without us being monitored. Could you could you kind of put some details on a use case like that? Sure. Um, can you give me an example of an e-commerce uh, that you use often? Please. Don't scare me, though. <laughs> uh, no, you, you know what? Never mind. Let's not get to specifics. But let's say that you want to order your favorite uh, hamburger um, from a local store. So you just, you know, you just uh, hit your mobile phone and you order, you you make an order. What happens there is that your details are th flowing through their that company's uh, backend servers, right? Their uh, infrastructure. And that is what has changed radically. It used to be one place where all the logic uh, was, usually it was on premise. But today, probably what happened is that that company, that big company that you're using, is using 
thousands of internal applications that interconnect between themselves and sending data from one place to another. That data, piece of data, flows to hundreds of different places because it's being stored uh, locally in some databases. Your credit card number uh, is being sent to an external service in order to, to use that. Um, your data is also being processed by data scientists inside and outside of that company. Therefore, that data flows around all the time, um, and usually it is a good thing, right? I mean, this is something that helps the service to be much better. However, for the security team of that company, um, and this is, uh, I'm sure that uh, your listeners that are in charge of doing that uh, can relate to the fact that they just don't know. They have to ask the engineers, where do we store uh, Mark's social security number? Where do we store his credit card number? Um, and hope that the engineer will know the answer. And this is more or less how they have governance. And this is a very manual process, which is prone to many mistakes. So are you trying to say that, that at some point you can automate this process to, to figure out all the different places where this data resides? And also find the risks about it. This is exactly what I'm saying. And this is exactly what DSPM uh, is all about. Data security posture management. This is the new uh, category also coined lately by Gartner is the next big thing in cybersecurity. And I'm sure that you will hear about it uh, very often in the next few months if you haven't already. The idea is to map where data is, uh, create a data catalog automatically, exactly. Also map the data flows, how data flows in your uh, system, how it's being shared, etc. And also based on that, finding risks, misconfigurations, and shadow data, uh, anything that might put your data at risk. And lastly, also help you to remediate those risks and also do detection and response to any kind of data, uh, potential data breach. Okay, so, and, and how does something like, like that work? I mean, is this just a, a typical network scan or how does, what's the technology behind it? Excellent question. Here, I think that uh, it might differ between different DSPMs. Um, and here also, I think it's, it's interesting because uh, data security is very different than other verticals uh, in cybersecurity. Um, and the reason is that usually, verticals are very defined, right? And when you are talking about endpoint security, it's pretty clear what you're protecting, the endpoint. When you're talking about SaaS security, you're protecting the SaaS. Uh, when you're talking about cloud security, you're protecting the cloud. However, data is in all of those places, right? And it's flowing between those places. So it's not really a vertical, it's more a horizontal problem. And then for your question of how exactly it's being done, it really depends on the scope of each company. Let's say that there is company. There are companies that uh, all their all they care about is data in their SaaS, right? In, in external uh, services where they're sending data, they might want to just scan that. And some DSPM, this is exactly what they do. Another example is uh, protecting data in public cloud, right? Uh, if you are concerned about what is your AWS, GCP, and Azure accounts, uh, DSPM can do that. Can scan only that. And there are some DSPMs, and actually Flow is included, uh, that are looking at it more holistically and data not only in one place, but how it flows between those places and discover it wherever it flows. Um, so it really depends on how exactly, what exactly the need for each company. Okay, and then, I mean, earlier you talked about there, there's a difference between uh, DSPM and CSPM. And it, is the difference just that CSPM is specifically for tracking data movement in the cloud? I think you nailed it. <laughs> CSPM isn't actually, originally it's not about data, right? It's about the infrastructure. Um, just like other verticals, CSPM was a vertical, and still is of course, a vertical about uh, the public cloud. If you want to know what happening in the infrastructure of applications, uh, also databases, of course, there is some overlap between DSPM and CSPM, but CSPM is about the cloud. However, DSPM uh, is, I mean, is different because data is the main focus wherever it is. And so it's data first and infrastructure uh, is second. And I think that it might be somewhat confusing because many DSPM vendors are talking about data only in the public cloud. And then someone can say, you know what, I already have visibility to my public cloud. 
Um, the next step, okay, so it's getting some classification, but it is mainly the, the same thing. It gets even more uh, confusing as today some CSPM vendors also offer some DSPM capabilities. However, I can say that the DSPM, as it's focused on data, it is, of course, it has to do with the cloud, but not only, because if someone cares about where do they have, again, social security numbers as an example of their customers, it's not only framed to the public cloud, right? It has to be wherever it is, even if it is uh, on premise, if it is uh, on endpoints or SaaS or wherever that is. So even for that there, are, there is some overlap between those two categories, the focus makes it completely different. Well, when you go out and engage with your prospective customers, how do you start the conversation? Usually today, they start the conversation um, because the problem is extremely clear. Usually it will be uh, after they, they understand the need, they understand and they, may, they might have had a data breach. It is a matter of focus. We are also uh, selling um, mostly to highly regulated markets like e-commerce and retail, healthcare, uh, fintech. These, these type of companies are the ones that the data security is the number one priority. So what they usually, um, the reason that they reach out to us is that they are doing what we offer, but in a very manual manner, which they find it in, inefficient and also very costly. Um, and then their need is to usually understand what they have and then also to protect the data, both for security reasons and compliance reasons. What are the most common questions that these prospective customers ask you? Usually it will be the scope. Uh, as it as we are in a very early market, each DSPM vendor tackle the problem from a different uh, angle. So they want to know what we cover and what uh, don't we cover. Um, beside that, also, uh, they ask about their specific use cases. Uh, and I can say, for example, specific um, for data breaches, the way that we see extremely often, also I've seen it in, in the last company, uh, is incident responder, uh, is actually not by a malicious activity, but a mistake being done by engineer causing data to be sent to the wrong place. For example, let's say that a company is sending data uh, to a third party that uh, collects data for marketing uh, um, reasons, as an example. They might want to to share only some specific information, like the first name of the customers and another data, another piece of data that is relevant. But they don't want to share all their data, right? They don't want to share too specific personal information. They don't want to share financial information. And uh, I won't mention names, but one of our customers, this is exactly what happened. They shared too much data, which caused a data breach without any malicious activity there. Um, so this is a use case that we're being asked uh, very frequently. And, and in terms of uh, how you deploy your tool, and I, I don't want to, I'm not going to talk too much um, about flow security, but it is very interesting to me. So when you deploy or, you know, um, start, start the process of using the flow securities tool, what does that look like? So the, um, uh, Usually, they are, I mean, as I, as I said, it depends what you're protecting, right? So I can say, and I, I'll try to be very generic, um, many DSPMs that covers only cloud uh, do it very similarly to CSPMs, and that is by scanning data at rest. You give them uh, an, um, an API to connect um, to the public cloud, and you give them permissions so they connect to an account. They can, first of all, um, discover all the different databases, data stores that each customer has, and also then classify the data in there. So this is um, what they usually do. Um, as you said at the beginning, why we are the only company that covers data wherever it flows is because uh, we have two different models. One is that one, the data at rest scanning, but the second one is the fact that we can actually analyze and uh, classify data. Uh, even How can motion. you do that? I mean, because to me, the the discovery process, I I get that, and in in terms of it, it, it actually 
I, I guess it's relatively secure because you know you're a third party or you know you're a vendor, right? And if you discover where my data is residing and you show me, I get that's the, okay, that's helpful information. But if you're actually getting in there and analyzing the data in, in terms of classifying it, I, at some point you have to have some type of access to the data itself. How, how does that work without creating an additional security concern? No, of course. Um, if, if we want to classify the data, we have to have permission uh, to the to the information itself. I must say that it's not it's there's nothing new there. Uh, every kind of security tool like a CSPM or XDR, they have to have access directly to the raw information in your uh, in your organization. Of course, we are doing it uh, for data. Uh, the way that uh, we are not being a concern ourselves. Uh, is the way that we're doing it. Uh, for example, we are accessing data only within the environment of the uh, organization. We do not send any data uh, outside of the organization. All the classification happens in place. Uh, also, uh, the way that I mean, the way that it's being built is that we cannot uh, access the data ourselves. It's everything happens automatically. So, no no one from our any employee of ours. And cannot access the data, and the classification happens uh, in place. Okay, and I, I'm, I'm assuming the classification is also automated. I mean, you're probably looking at, you know, the, the patterns as are, are, are these social security numbers, are these credit card numbers, or is there another way to classify the data? Yeah, this is exactly it. Uh, of course, the way that we're doing it uh, is not only by using patterns, it's also based on machine learning algorithms, and also by contextual understanding of the data it depends not only on what is the payload itself what are the you know bits of the data but also what is the metadata where it came from how it was already being tagged uh, by some applications sometimes automatically some manu manually uh, and by collecting all that information we can create a full picture and then have a very good automating tool in order to tag that data um, without the need of manual uh, manual work when did you um, found Flow Security? It was a bit more than two years ago. So how do you go from founding a company to two years ago or to a little more than two years ago to actually developing a tool that does all of this? I mean, two years doesn't seem like a, a long time to develop such a comprehensive tool. How did you do that? Um, actually, the first deployment, the first customers, we're in a matter of a few weeks <laughs> from starting the company. I, I think that you've got when, some amazing developers, man. So. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it started from having a, an excellent co-founder. Our CDO is, I mean, he's insane. <laughs> he's so good. Um, and also, I think that when we started the company, it was crystal clear to us the vision of how exactly this is going to look like, how the market is going to evolve in a way that eventually it really did. Um, so as it was so clear to us, and also we already had um, potential customers that when they saw only the presentation, only the idea of what we were about to build, they were extremely excited of what we were doing. And so we had the luck to work with really big companies as design partners. Um, and yes, we developed a very basic uh, tool in the beginning of 2021, um, which led us to to develop very quickly the full platform that we have today, which is deployed in production environment um, with paying customers, including Fortune 500 companies. Um, and yes, we're now in the growth stage where we we keep uh, getting more and more new customers uh, almost every week. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean it's it's always good to start a business after you have some customers on the side waiting for you to develop what you have. I mean, it gives you a very secure feeling. And then you also get the feedback from those customers. I mean, if you've got a a, a good relationship from, from, with them from the beginning, you know, they know that it might not be perfect right out of the box, but if they're, if they're partnering with you to develop something or they're waiting for you to, um, you can get that feedback and that just helps the whole dev cycle. Um, so, so tell me, you know, where do you see data security tools? Um, how how are they going to evolve over the next ten years? Yeah, first of all, as for your for your last point, I couldn't agree more. And I think that the relationship with those customers and the users is not only necessary in the first days. I think that even today, 
uh, I see it as a major thing. And uh, this is not only a vendor a customer kind of relationship, but we see it as collaboration. Um, and it's absolutely wonderful. Um, so yes, as for your question, how do we see it uh, developing? We are now seeing we are not we are now seeing only the top the tip of the iceberg. Um, I think now the SPM is trying to catch up extremely quickly, uh, and companies already um, are allocating budget for 2023, uh, understanding that it is one of their uh, next big. Um, uh, you know, chunks of focus for 2023. Um, and I think it's only the beginning. Uh, now we are seeing that um, the need is very clear. Uh, this is one of the nice things about being a DSPM vendors. I don't have to explain anyone why do they need a DSPM tool. It's pretty clear to everyone. However, how exactly it's being done and how comprehensive it's going to happen to be, um, this is a, a big question. And another big thing is that how exactly it's going to evolve in the existing workflow of current security teams. Because I think that the last thing that uh, security teams need is yet another dashboard uh, to refresh every week uh, to see if there are any new alerts uh, that they are already already have the, the famous alert fatigue. Um, and I think that another thing that we will see after the rise of DSPM and after there will be clear winners in that uh, um, in that world is also um, some consolidation with bigger platforms, uh, how that works in, in the bigger perspective of uh, risk management of detection and response and how data takes yet another extremely important pillar uh, in security strategies of big companies. No, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I have friends that their job is to go out and de de deploy uh, SOX, global SOX, um, security operation centers. And, you know, especially for the larger companies out there, they don't want to work with a bunch of fragmented different tools. They want one center that brings all the signal into it and allows them to respond from there. So that consolidation piece totally makes sense. Um, what uh, I noticed in the brief that you, you you can give some advice on how companies can create a strong security culture. I, give talk a little bit about that because you know I, I'm a, I'm a firm believer that it's that the technology is great, but really we need to have our people be aware um, of what the potential threats are and best practices. But how can you get a company that doesn't have that strong security culture to kind of evolve where security becomes a, a priority? No, that's, that's an excellent question. I think that in my opinion, companies tend to take one extreme or the other. Either they are having all kinds of controls and tools and uh, thinking that technology will solve all of their security problems, or it's the other extreme, saying our security is based on culture and education, and then they're doing a lot of courses and a lot of you know, e explaining engineers how to develop securely, et cetera. And I think that neither of those work. They cannot be, they, one cannot live without the other. And I think that something that companies should ask themselves is whether their technology works well with their culture around security. And I will explain. Um, one thing is telling your, uh, uh, you know what, I'll actually I'll give a, a specific example. Today, the way that data catalog is being done, how uh, companies know where their data is, is just by asking, like actually sending questionnaires to engineers, and tell, sell, asking them where do they store data, and also telling them where how the data should be handled, uh, etc. Uh, or the other extreme is to to map data automatically, scan each database, which of course is impossible. And I think that in this example, it's it's important to find the balance between the two. If you have a tool that um, scan data or give you an aut automation of where data is, you can use that as a base for the conversation with engineers to have that one-stop shop or the one source of truth of what is happening in an environment and based on that setting the policies, based, based on that setting the communication and doing the education around it and also to avoid uh, a friction 
between security and engineering, which often happens when there are when that balance is not in the right place. I think that's some, some excellent advice. Hey, let me let me ask you this. Let's um let's just kind of switch tracks completely here and um, go outside of Flow Security's offering and the DSPM and CSPM kind of discussion. Just in general, um, I'm going to ask you for advice for consumers and then businesses. But let's start with consumers. Just for individuals out there, what are the one or two things that they must do to kind of uh, secure their data and personal information? So I'll start with consumers. One is the question of uh, send data only to uh, you know organizations that you trust, right? Uh, people tend to very easily give away their information for a specific tool, uh, sometimes for smaller companies. I would just suggest not doing it if not necessary, uh, because this is just to reduce the risk. Besides that, there are also some very practical um, things that I think people can do. Uh, one is around passwords, how they manage their passwords uh, and not setting the same password for every website. I think today there are many tools like password managers uh, that help with that uh, and, and reduces the risk significantly. But maybe the last tip for consumers, and I think this is the most important, is to be extremely aware of any kind of threat they might get. And this is usually give, get by email or by uh, LinkedIn or even Skype, where they, they might see a message that might be might look extremely legitimate, uh, but it is part of a credential theft. Again, the password managers uh, help to avoid that because they don't recognize the domain as, a, as an authorized domain. But if they do it, if, they, uh, if the customers do it manually, they might give away their credentials, the username and password uh, to their websites. And this is what leads to data breaches. So I, I would say that for consumers, awareness, reducing the data that they're sharing and all and be extremely cautious with their passwords. And um, I think the, when, when if you do these three things, you're much better than the average. For for companies, for you know, for the B2B uh, kind of tips. Uh, I don't think that we have enough time. I think it takes a bit, <laughs> a, 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 a bit more than, than a few minutes to to cover that. Um, but I think just, that, just give me your top top, you know, one, two, or three kind of tips. It will be a bit generic, uh, so sorry about that. But I would say that prioritization is everything. You should when you are tackling, when you are handling your or starting to build your security strategy, start with defining what are the things that scare you the most, what keeps you up at night, uh, whether it is, um, I don't know, uh, phishing uh, data like that, whether it is an insider threat, whether it is, I don't know, even a governmental kind of threat of other, uh, of, you know, other companies, of other, sorry, other countries, really define that and then uh, put it on paper, what are the scenarios that you're trying to avoid? I think this is some, uh, a step that many security teams skip and just go directly to the templates. Like, okay, we need to have an endpoint security tool. We need to have, I don't know, a firewall or an API security tool or, or whatever. And I think that when you define, when you predefine before anything, what are the things that you want to avoid, then you can prioritize wh wh where you should start and also focus on the things that matter the most. And you can just, you know, it, it, there are some other things that you can leave for next year. Don't worry. And security will not end in the next few months. It, it, that plan is going to evolve. But start with what keeps you up at night and <laughs> not in what you are, what you found in a template that a friend sent to you from two years ago. That's funny. I mean, I, I agree with everything you're saying, but it's funny because it, what, what keeps you up at night, I just can't imagine being a CISO for, you know, a multinational corporation mm -hmm. because there are so, there would be so many things that would be keeping me up at night. I don't know how they sleep. Um, but, <laughs> um, but I, you know, the job is what it is. Hey, um, let's go back to the, uh, the, you, you mentioned LinkedIn and I, and I know you were talking about credential theft. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious if you have any insights. I get these requests on LinkedIn from people that it's obviously 
a fake profile. Okay. It's, right. it's just clearly, it, it's just kind of almost like nonsensical, but they're out there connecting with people. And I'm trying to figure out, is this just like a social engineering thing where they, they want to connect with you and then they can see your information and maybe use that to kind of create some message or what's the, what's the angle there? What, what are they doing? I think the connection, LinkedIn connections, uh, anyway, many people just, you know, just add whoever. Um, and I think that the connection itself shouldn't be a threat. The, the the thing is that, as you said, there are some fake accounts, someone that can identify himself as a CISO of a company while he, well, there is no such person. And there are many tools today that help those malicious actors uh, to act uh, that way. It's extremely easy to generate a picture of, or many pictures of a person that does not exist, uh, to generate the content around it, uh, and, it, and they look extremely real. And um, so as for the reasons why they do it, there can be several uh, examples. One is um, just to start talking and to have, to get some information because they know that uh, if they will identify themselves as themselves, they, you won't give that information. Uh, or, or let's say that uh, someone wants to get information about your next podcast, right? They want to um, to get that information because they are a competition or something like that. That can be a, an example because they, they can do a, a fake account of the persona that they believe that you will want to, to talk to, right? Like someone, mm -hmm. uh, your ideal profile that you are looking for. Um, so this is one example that can happen. Um, another thing can be not to get some information, but actually to steal your credentials. They might say, uh, I don't know, identify themselves as a CEO of a company that uh, moves you, right? That when you when you see him, you say, you know what? I really want to talk with him, uh, or something that might give you a lot of money due to uh, uh, some kind of collaboration. And then they can, they might send you uh, like a form a to fill out. Yep. <laughs> yeah, the, the, a document using Google Drive, just put in your username and password to your Google account uh, to see how much money we're going to give you uh, right. <laughs> for, 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 for a very small project. Um, and this comes back as a consumer, uh, also as a business, but as an individual, to be extremely aware of that, to be very suspicious, to ask question to make sure that you log into your accounts uh, when you enter the domain and not through links uh, that are being sent through email. Uh, this is extremely important. Some some good advice and, and uh, observations. I uh, yeah, there's just there's just so many. I mean, the world that I grew up in is very different from the, the world today. And, you know, it used to be you just have to like have somebody guard your front door um, or may possibly your mail, uh, your mailbox. But I mean, you know, we have all these new different tools. And as you mentioned, especially with the, the rise of the cloud, all these different applications and different places that our data could be, uh, sometimes it's, it's kind of mind boggling, but there's, I'm glad that there are people out there like you that, um, and, and, uh, flow security that are, that are working on solutions to help protect our data. Hey, um, do you, are you planning over the next year to go to any industry events or anything like that where people could uh, possibly meet, meet you face to face? Of course, we'll probably be in all of them. I think the okay. next big one <laughs> will be our RSA conference in April. Uh, it will take place in San Francisco. So we have a booth there uh, and we'll be around uh, for meetings. Uh, later on, there's the Bl a Black Hat event uh, in July or August, I'm not sure, in Las Vegas. Um, and there are many small events. Uh, if uh, I don't know, if someone uh, heard us and uh, thought that it might be interesting to get more information, I, I would recommend just going to our website or our LinkedIn page, um, where there's a lot of information about uh, everything that we talked today and much more. Um, but also uh, to see the events that we're going to uh, attend um, and also scheduling a meeting. Um, I'm extremely available. Awesome. Well, hey, Jonathan, I've really enjoyed this conversation and I wish you a great close to this year and an awesome 2023. Thank you so much. Have a great new year and hopefully 2023 will be more secure than 2022 and not the other way around. Fingers crossed. Hello, welcome to Secure Talk, your trusted source of information on the latest threats, trends, tools, and technology related to cybersecurity and compliance.